What are some of the keys to helping a woman experience pleasure and orgasms? And if you're a woman and you're not having orgasms and you want to be, then this episode could be really helpful. Sure, for you, but especially for your partner. Maybe leave this episode's transcript under their pillow. It's going to be a dive down under the covers where you get to hear our guest take a fierce stand for your orgasms. So come along for the ride. But first, Relationship Alive is my offering to you to help you have a thriving, dynamic relationship. If you're finding the show to be helpful, please consider a donation to ensure that we can continue. And in the coming year, we're going to be having some cool things happening for people who are contributing to the show. So to choose something that feels right for you, just visit neilsatin.com slash support or text the word support to the number 33444 and follow the instructions. And this week, I would like to thank Timothy, Eleni, Kathleen, Lynn, Karina, David, and Angie. Thank you so much for your generous contributions to help keep the lights on here at Relationship Alive headquarters. We're going to be covering some intimate ground for today's show. And there's nothing that can challenge your communication more than having to talk about some of these deeply personal things. So if you want to take your communication to a higher level, then download my top three relationship communication secrets. It's free for you. And by implementing these tips, you'll be able to connect with your partner, no matter how challenging or intimate the topic. Just visit neilsatin.com slash relate or text the word relate to the number 33444 to download the guide. And finally, if you're on Facebook and looking for support in your relationship, come join the Relationship Alive community. We've created a safe space with more than 2,500 people who listen to Relationship Alive who are there to help give you feedback about your relationship journey. See you there. And now, let's get on with the show. Hello and welcome to another episode of Relationship Alive. This is your host, Neil Satin. Today's guest is Ian Kerner, who is a nationally recognized sexuality counselor, specializing in sex therapy, couples therapy, and working with individuals on a range of related issues. He's regularly quoted as an expert in various media outlets and has appeared on CNN, The Today Show, The Dr. Oz Show, and now he's here on Relationship Alive. Ian is the New York Times bestselling author of numerous books, including She Comes First, which is what we're here to talk about today. And I should say that She Comes First is subtitled The Thinking Man's Guide to Pleasuring a Woman. In addition to being a clinical fellow of the American Association of Marriage and Family Therapists, Ian is also certified by ASECT, the American Association of Sexuality Educators, Counselors, and Therapists, with a doctorate in clinical sexology. If you download the transcript of today's episode, you will also get a bonus action guide with highlights and action items from today's show. You can do that at neilsatin.com slash Ian, I-A-N, or by texting the word PASSION to the number 33444 and following the instructions. Ian Kerner, thank you so much for joining us today on Relationship Alive. Thanks, Neil. My pleasure. Well, we are here primarily to talk about She Comes First, which is a book about how to give pleasure to a woman. Mm -hmm. And before we get started, I was wondering if you could just let our listeners know a little bit more about you and how you came to write this book. 
Uh, sure. Well, I guess that there are two ways I came to write the book. One is sort of the um, professional path, and the other is the personal path. Uh, professionally, as a sex therapist, um, at the time that I wrote the book, and, and even through to today, um, one of the questions I get asked most often by women is what can I do to have an orgasm during intercourse and what am I doing wrong and that it's not happening? So I really um, wrote the book as a response to that question. I wanted to let women know um, you're not doing um, anything wrong. It's just that you know a lot of the uh, men that you may happen to be partnered with are what I would call illiterate. Um, they know uh, more about what's under the hood of a car than the hood of a clitoris, and it's often through no fault of their own. And uh, there's nothing wrong with you. It's just that we are sort of all trapped in the what I'd call the intercourse discourse in terms of thinking of sex often in in one way, and that once you kind of break out of the intercourse discourse and think of other ways of play- Pleasuring. And once men understand that the clitoris is the powerhouse of the female orgasm and how to stimulate the clitoris, then you really won't be asking the question, uh, what can I do to have an orgasm during intercourse? You may not be having intercourse at all, or you may be having intercourse plus other activities. So that's kind of the uh, professional path. Um, Personally, I suffered for many years from a very common sexual dysfunction, uh, premature ejaculation. It's actually um, more prevalent than uh, erectile disorder, but certainly much less talked about. And it's uh, uh, an issue that leaves many men feeling sexually crippled, uh, leaves many partners feeling frustrated and uh, dissatisfied. And uh, I I suffered... um, Quite a bit, quite a bit from this issue to the point that uh, it affected uh, my desire to date, my desire uh, to make love to a woman, um, certainly my confidence and my self-esteem. And when I began to learn more about um, female sexuality and the, about the power of the uh, clitoris as sort of the the centerpiece of uh, female sexual arousal, and I was able to. Um, learn how to pleasure a woman in in other ways outside of just intercourse and with my and using just my penis and I began to make love with um not just my penis but my mouth and my mind and my hands and every other part of my mind body and soul it really um it really liberated me and it ac- and actually that liberation um, and that confidence and self-esteem became one of the most important tools that I gained at my disposal to manage um, premature ejaculation. So that is sort of the professional and personal pathway that led to writing She Comes First. And um, it, I've been you know, um, amazed um, over the years in terms of how the book has um, resonated and uh, continues to uh, sell. And um, I hear not just from men, but from uh, women as well who learn from the book and give it to their partners. And uh, probably um, I'm most flattered when I hear from a parent who... Um, you know, says whether it's a mom or a dad, I I want my son um, to be sexually competent and to be respectful of female sexuality and understand female sexuality. And so I I gave my book, uh, I gave your book to my um, eighteen year old son. Um, so uh, that, that's a little bit of background uh, to she comes first. Yeah, that's great, and it's it's really interesting to me because, well, for one thing. We had Wendy Maltz on the show to talk about sexual healing, and and I, f- I got connected with you through Wendy, um, and that was without really even knowing what you had done and what you were what you were writing about. And then on the show, we've also talked a lot um, with a with a few people in particular, uh, Diana Richardson, who wrote Heart of Tantra, and then also Marnia Robinson, who wrote Cupid's Poison Arrow about both non-orgasmic sex um, 
and also the the problems that that orgasms can cause, particularly for men, um, in disconnecting them from their partner. And I'm bringing both of these things up because uh, as I was reading your book, which is um, basically about how to perform cunnilingus, like that's mm -hmm. what this book is about. And and it does it in a very informative way where I learned a lot about uh, female sexuality that I didn't even know necessarily. And, um, and it's... I, I wanted to bring this actually to to our audience because sometimes, for one thing, you may just want to go for it and have orgasms and you want to have some great um, methods and knowledge at your disposal on how to do that so you're not just winging it. And I, I, liked, I appreciated how in the book you brought up that um, most men actually don't have a lot of sources of information for how to please a woman. It's maybe the locker room, probably porn. And apart from that, there's not a lot of guidance being offered. Mm -hmm. So I liked how you offer it from that perspective as a way to, to help pre bring people up the curve. Yeah, no, thank you. I mean, certainly on one level, the book is a very practical guide in how to uh, uh, pleasure a woman and how to, um, you know, create uh, or get help mutually co-construct and create uh, orgasmic um, satisfaction. And that is, I believe, um, through uh, cunnilingus, uh, not only in my own experiences, but um you know, study after study shows that uh, women, not that they prefer oral sex to intercourse, just that they most uh, more consistently um, orgasm from cunnilingus as opposed to intercourse. That has a lot to do with the distance between the clitoris and the vaginal entrance. And uh, in some women, it can be anywhere from two centimeters to four centimeters. And many sexual positions or most sexual positions miss the clitoris um, altogether. And the greater the distance, they call it the vaginal clitoral distance, the greater the distance between uh, the clitoris, uh, well, the clitoral glands, the head of the clitoris, what's visible, and the vaginal ent entrance, the greater that distance, the harder it is for a woman to... Um, orgasm through intercourse. So certainly manual stimulation, whether with your hand or with a sex toy, and oral stimulation um, are um, more direct and consistent ways of um, uh, eliciting uh, orgasms. And uh, I want it, and I hope that the book, and I think actually the staying power of the book has been that it's a, a little more than just a cunnilingus guide in that it is uh, both... Um, you know, a real introduction to um, understanding uh, female sexuality. Um, and hopefully there's a little bit of um, a fun philosophy um, in it as well. And um, I, I just came across a really interesting statistic that um, uh, related to porn use and that um, heterosexual women are um, – the biggest consumers of uh, lesbian porn. So heterosexual women are the biggest consumers of uh, lesbian porn. And that's for a couple of reasons. One, that heterosexual porn uh, often really objectifies women, and that's not a turn-on to women who are watching porn. And then, of course, lesbian porn um, features a lot more cunnilingus. And when you look at the top search terms by women that women enter into porn sites, how, 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 how explicit is this show, Neil? How uh, G-rated, PG-rated, R-rated do you want me to keep it? Uh, we're good. We we uh, rate it explicit on iTunes. Okay. Yeah. Um, so when you look at the top five However, terms, let me just interrupt you and say, if you're listening with your eight-year-old in the car right now, it might be a good time to hit pause and then come okay. back to it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I would say you should have hit pause like 10 minutes ago. <laughs> uh, but if you need to hit pause now, go ahead and hit pause now. Um, but uh, the top terms are things like pussy licking, pussy eating, uh, pussy touching. I mean, it, they're all terms that really come back to clitoral stimulation and particularly oral stimulation of the clitoris. So um, I guess, you know, I just wanted to, um, you know, provide a little bit of context and uh, both around the importance of direct clitoral stimulation and um, the way that um, um, 
I'm I'm trying through the book um, to take an act that's traditionally considered foreplay and turn it into core play, a, a complete act of lovemaking that really vouchsafes and guarantees almost uh, the female orgasm. Yeah, I love that, especially because we are arriving at a very similar place where we're talking about expanding the definition of, uh, definition of intimacy and expanding what it means to be making love with your partner um, coming at it from different directions, but it, we arrive at this very similar place, which is how are you really exploring sensuality with your partner? And are you doing it in a way that's actually not objectifying your partner, but really about tapping into what really makes them tick and feel good? Mm -hmm. So let's start with that because one of the most fascinating things in reading your book was that there are 18 parts to the clitoris and I'm, I'm not expecting you to necessarily remember what all of those are right here <laughs> okay. now, but, um, but I was like, what are you even talking about? And then you went on to, to, uh, elucidate. And so I'm, I'm hoping that you can just give, give us a, a little bit of a taste of what, um, right. what you're talking about. Right. So, um, Male and female sexual um, anatomy, although they, they look very different, um, they're actually uh, homologous. And that means during the uh, early months of uh, gestation, when a woman is, is pregnant with a baby, um, the baby isn't really differentiated as male or female um, until around the 12th or 13th week. And up until that time, the baby doesn't really have um, an assigned sex. And... Um, all of the um, tissue that's um, ultimately going to form uh, the genital structures, it's really up for grabs which way is it going to go, male or female. And then around the, the 12th or 13th week, there's some uh, you know different bursts of hormones, um, uh, namely testosterone. And, um, you know, the, the fetus is either uh, differentiated as male or female, but all of the same tissue is used. And, you know, male sexual anatomy will grow outward into uh, a penis and um, a scrotum with, with text testicles, and it's all very visible. But those same structures really um, exist for women. They just kind of grow Grow, everything grows inwards. And so what you end up seeing is um, a vulva that includes uh, a vaginal entrance and um, uh, inner and outer labia, as well as what we would also call the, the clitoris. Um, really, what we tend to think of as the clitoris, and sometimes people refer to it as a, a bump or uh, the little man in the boat or the pea in the pod. I mean, there's a lot of sort of... Um, vernacular around the clitoris, but really that, that what you're seeing is the, the head of the clitoris or the clitoral glands, just as a, a guy has a, a head on his penis. And really, um, for a woman, that, that clitoral glands is really just kind of the, uh, the tip of the iceberg. And there's um, a whole um, um, internal uh, development of sexual anatomy um, and and really, um, the, the the latest you know, the latest science is really showing um, that that all of that material um, really encompasses what you would consider sort of like the clitoral network, and so that even the G spot is probably just the back end roots of um, the clitoris, and so that's really what I mean when I say that the clitoris has 18 parts. That the part that we normally associate with the, usually or generally associate with the clitoris, again, is really just the tip of the iceberg. And there are other parts um, that are internal um, and external that that constitute the totality of um, the clitoral network, and it would be. Um, extremely, it, it's really rather rare um, for a woman to really experience um, arousal and, and certainly orgasm uh, without uh, clitoral stimulation. Right. So even if you're having, say, vaginal orgasms, 
that's probably because you're stimulating the part of the clitoris that is actually surrounding. Correct. And those parts of the clitoris tend to be either on the surface of the vulva or within the first inch or two of the vaginal entrance. And the deeper you go into the vagina, the less the less nerve endings there are, the less uh, sensitivity there is. And so really, when you think about making love, making love to a woman, rather than thinking vaginally, you should really be thinking clitorally. And rather than thinking about penetration, you should be thinking about stimulation. And rather than thinking about uh, really internal stimulation, you should be thinking about external stimulation of the vulva. Yeah, so hence what you were talking about earlier about how the, the, the penetration really doesn't even have to happen at all. No, it it really doesn't, and that's why you know when you uh, when men obsess over penis size. Not to say that uh, size is totally irrelevant, or that size doesn't matter, or that it doesn't feel good to a woman to have a penis, you know, inside a a vagina. I'm not trying to discredit entirely the the role of the penis and in, in 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 pleasure in a woman, but I don't think that um, really. Um, uh, size uh, is as relevant as as men think it is. Mm. So, and what when you're talking to people about um, performing oral sex on a woman, what kind of problems or obstacles do you run into around actually someone diving in to doing that? Okay. Well, I mean, first of all, um, it is about. Um, thinking of oral sex not just as sort of an optional appetizer, but as a required entree and understanding, thinking of oral sex, um, clitoral stimulation, um, you know, as a complete act of lovemaking that often can um, include uh, the female orgasm. It's also not just what you're doing, but when you're doing it and being tuned into a woman's um, arousal arc and uh, thinking of it as a dance in which you are both participants and which she's often leading the dance in order to cue to you the type of stimulation that at the time feels good and right. I mean, as, as we sort of know, the more you get aroused, the more tolerance you have um, for sensation. So certain things that may feel not so great at the beginning um, may feel really great towards the end of um, a, an act of lovemaking closer to orgasm. Uh, the other thing that I deal with is probably just, um, oh, you know, self-esteem issues, misconceptions. You know, I, I often am working with couples in which, you know, Ironically, believe it or not, it's often the male partner who's uh, very eager to um, engage in oral sex, really loves going down on his partner, really enjoys it, wants to sort of liberate himself from the tyranny of his penis. Um, I'm using rather uh, hyperbolic language today on this podcast. <laughs> um and and very often it's a female partner who has you know genital self esteem issues so maybe she feels like um um she doesn't look beautiful down there or taste wonderful or smell great or maybe she feels like she's taking too long women often can bring a lot of anxiety around uh, receiving oral sex. And for many women, especially women who have experienced faking orgasms, it's sometimes easier to um, give pleasure than it is to receive pleasure. Um, I know a lot of women who really enjoy giving pleasure and um, can really participate in that way. But when it comes to receiving pleasure, they tend to get very anxious or, or very inhibited. And so, um, you know, a lot of times, um, you know, that's that's the point at which I'm kind of entering into the situation. And, and certainly there are men who are ambivalent about oral sex, who um, don't understand it as being um, important, who don't understand clitoral stimulation, who maybe have had some negative experiences in the past or were brought up to feel that maybe a woman's vulva or vagina is... Um, unhygienic in some way. So there can be a lot of myths and misconceptions and um, opportunities for discomfort around oral sex. That brings up so many questions for me. I guess the first one would be, 
Well, let's talk about those hangups. So if someone is really feeling self-conscious about them, their own vagina or vulva, how do you work with someone like that so that they can relax into receiving? I mean, it, 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 it's, it's sort of like, you know, throwing a, a stone into a, a pond and watching the ripples, you know, at, at, at what, how, how close to the stone are you going to get? Like, at what point do you address the rippling? Do you think that, well, you know, really, I want to be in the kind of relationship that lends itself to intimate, connected sex, and I really need to focus more on the positivity in the relationship and being in a sex-positive relationship and being able to communicate openly and constructively and arousingly around sex. And then maybe you need to get closer to the sex act itself and what are you really doing to stimulate um, desire and arousal um, I mean, some studies really show that uh, the closer a woman gets to orgasm, the more parts of the the more parts of the brain that are associated with stress, anxiety, high emotion deactivate, and that as a woman is having an orgasm, she's actually entering into almost a kind of a trance-like state. And so, what is happening to facilitate that process of deactivation, where a woman can shut down those? Um, stress centers in the brain and those anxiety centers and what are you doing in the actual environment around sex to create a sex conducive environment to actually create sort of um, a love nest and does that require music does it require lighting does it require certain types of um, you know being dressed or or undressed like what does it take for um, a woman to feel really comfortable and then I think the most important factor is really to be able to hear from a guy, um, hopefully a guy with whom she loves and has a secure, trusting attachment that she can really let go with, to hear from a guy, uh, to be reassured, like, you know, you are absolutely beautiful and I love doing this and it's arousing to me and I get so turned on by this. And the longer it takes, actually, the more I'm just postponing my own gratification and the more intense my own gratification is going to be. I think so many women just wonder, does he like doing this or is it a chore? And you ask so many men and they say, well, I love doing it. It's the last thing from a chore. It's completely arousing. I get into my own kind of Zen head space. And then, you know, just the way you would look into a woman's eyes and let her know how beautiful you find her. Um, I think you want to be able to let her know how beautiful you find her, her vulva. And you want to contribute to, again, that concept of genital self-esteem, positive genital self-esteem. That doesn't come from just, you know, your own sense of your body. Like you need to be told by your partner that you are beautiful. And I think, you know, we often are focused on, oh, your hair looks great or that dress looks great or you look so hot and sexy right now. And, you know, we need to be able to extend those compliments um, um, to, to our mutual genitals. Yeah. Yeah. And you, I noticed you were using the pronoun he, but I mean, this can apply. Right. For- Absolutely. Absolutely. I didn't mean to to take the words out of your mouth, but yes, it can apply to, um, um, I I work with a lot of um, lesbian women who have bought She Comes First because they may have some inhibitions around oral sex or they want to be more proficient. And so, yes, I didn't mean to be gender specific, although I do have to say I didn't write the book in a gender neutral way. A lot of sex books and I've written a bunch of them can be written in a gender neutral way, but I really wanted to um, send a specific message to heterosexual men. Yeah. And probably rightly so, because if nothing else, we don't have a woman's body. So we don't have, and in fact, like our penises can probably take a lot more and a lot different kinds of stimulation, um, you know, that, that we don't even think about, um, then, then, then we might practice if we didn't know any better when we were with a woman. 
Yeah, I think that's true. I mean, you know, when you look at the age at which men start having nocturnal emissions or wet dreams and they start masturbating and having their first orgasms, there's a, you know, a huge concentration all in those, you know, early teen years, 13, 14, 15, and men have their first ejaculations and they figure out how to give them the, themselves those ejaculations, you know, repeatedly. And, um, you know, for most men, orgasm and sex are very tied together. And um, most men wouldn't really think twice if you asked them, do you know how to give yourself um, uh, an orgasm? But when you look at um, women, um, it, it's, it's a very different story. Um, across the board, women have their first orgasms and vastly different ages. Many women who have had orgasms early in their teen years don't necessarily know exactly how to replicate them. I, even today, I have a number of women in my practice who um, weren't really sure they've ever had orgasms. They've certainly enjoyed sex and they've felt a lot of arousal, but they're not sure that they've had um, orgasms. Yeah. Um, one thing that you mentioned in you know just a few moments ago it came out as as um part of how you reassure a partner um but i i heard you talking about the th what you call the three assurances mm -hmm. so i'm wondering if we can just enumerate those for people listening so they know exactly what you're talking about that because these seem really key yeah. Do you mind if I go grab the book off my shelf then? I don't have it. You so know what? I, I, I can, might... I'll read them out loud. Oh, that would be lovely. <laughs> Why I have it right in front of me. Oh, okay. Yeah. I didn't mean this for this to be a pop quiz. No, like no, 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 no. But I, I, I think the book says it better than I would just impromptu. Yeah. So what you write are to that end, the three assurances of the cunnilinguist manifesto are as follows. Number one, going down on her t turns you on. You enjoy it as much as she does. Um, so I would paraphrase that something like, your pleasure gives me pleasure. Absolutely. Um, number two, there's no rush. She has all the time in the world. You want to savor every moment. So that's taking the time pressure off and letting it just be what it is. And I have a question about that, but I'll come back to it. Okay. And then the third thing is that her scent is provocative, her taste powerful. It all emanates from the same beautiful essence. So basically where you're saying the whole visceral experience of being there is great, is amazing for me. So the question I had about the second one, the all the time in the world is, um, you know, the book is about bringing a woman to orgasm and yet we also talk a lot about not being orgasm focused and being real sort of process oriented instead of <laughs> product mm -hmm. oriented uh-huh well that's interesting i don't yeah, yeah. <laughs> let's 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 talk about this i mean so um um i i don't think that there is anything necessarily wrong with being orgasm focused. I mean, our body um, um, participates in the process of arousal. There is a vasocongestion, but blood flow to the genitals. There's myotonia. There's uh, sexual tension being developed throughout the body. And when those two um, processes kind of reach a tipping point, um, that 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 muscular tension um, causes orgasm, which is a you know a, a flood of different sort of feel good hormones that um, you know are, are all triggered and connected to the the release of uh, sexual tension. And and men and women have uh, uh, capacities to orgasm. Women have an innate capacity uh, to experience multiple orgasms. And certainly over the course of the life cycle, our relationship with orgasm changes. And uh, orgasms can feel differently and happen at different intervals. And uh, um, we can, um, you know, lose our ability uh, to have orgasms. But um, I don't think that there's anything wrong with um, 
being being focused on or wanting to have an orgasm or wanting a partner to have an orgasm and and very often you'll you will hear um in the media and in writing and from um uh, professional therapists, many of whom are my colleagues, you know, you'll sometimes hear, well, um, men tend to be orgasm focused. Women tend to be more process focused and more pleasure focused, uh, can enjoy sex um, without having necessarily having an orgasm every time. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, I think that there there is some truth to that, but I also um, want to just say that, like, I meet with women every day in my practice who are sometimes on their own or sometimes um, as part of a couple, and they are often very, very, very frustrated uh, that they're not having orgasms in the sex that they're having. And given the choice between not having an orgasm and having an orgasm, they would much rather have one. And certainly there are times in life when you don't always have an orgasm, but if you're in a relationship where you are having sex and you're consistently not having orgasms, um, I'm going to wager that, you know, there's going to be a lot of uh, distress and dissatisfaction. And I think also that one of the reasons we often tend to say, oh, women kind of are more can be pleasure focused or less concerned or care less about orgasms is because men... We don't live in a culture where men really consistently are tuned in, care, and can kind of elicit orgasms consistently. So I think a lot of that sort of um, verbiage around being pleasure-focused and non-orgasm-focused is also justifying you know, a paradigm in which men always get to have orgasms during sex and um, women do not. And so, um, uh, my dogs are barking incessantly in the background. Um, um, they agree with you. <laughs> so I, I just want to challenge that, that assumption again. Like, uh, listen, I understand that, um, we should all be pleasure focused. I worked with a client for the last few weeks and, and, and he's a gay man and uh, he experiences erectile issues and delayed ejaculation. And one of the biggest changes he made um, on his OkCupid okay profile is saying that he is um, pleasure focused as opposed to orgasm focused. So um, I don't want to say that I don't uh, understand the sentiment and that there aren't certain people for whom they really are going to be more pleasure focused than orgasm focused. But I also also really don't want to discount the value and importance of orgasm. And I don't want to live in a world where we think that, oh, men consistently get to have their orgasms and women don't. And that's okay because women are more pleasure focused and less orgasm focused than men. Yeah. Um, I really appreciate your taking a, a stand for the, for the orgasm just now. And it makes a lot of sense that that um, the mechanism is there. So if the if the experience of not having an orgasm is is about the inability to have an orgasm, or about um, well the not being able to take the time to have an orgasm, which is what what brought us down this topic, um, this line of conversation, um, then yeah, like. Don't don't let don't let it be an excuse for by any means. Right now, you know the other myth that's out there. It's not exactly a myth, but it's it's there's it's sort of a a semi truth is that it it takes women uh, longer to get aroused and reach orgasm than it does men, and that's certainly something that I see in my practice all the time. That I wrote in she comes first. That I I, I pretty much stand by. But when you also talk um, to women about masturbation um, and their sort of approach to self-pleasure, um, many, if not most women will say, well, if I want to, I can get there in three minutes. And it kind of starts to really resemble the way men masturbate. And the, uh, the road to orgasm can be as short for women as it is um, for men. That doesn't always translate into relational sex um, between two people. But I would say it's also... Um, 
something of a myth um, that you know it it always takes women longer to reach orgasm, and that so even for uh, even in my uh, reassurance about time, and you have all the time in the world, and you're just happy to be there, it doesn't have to be a chore, and it doesn't have to take so long. Yeah. Yeah, and another thing I wanted to just clarify for you too is that when I say that here on the show, we've talked a lot about non-orgasmic sex, we've been really approaching it from the perspective of, well, for one thing, the the way that for a man having an orgasm changes the um, the level of connection that they're experiencing with their partner when they're making love. So in a way, it's like taking it off the table so that you can actually prolong what's what's happening when mm-hmm. you are doing the rest of the stuff which mm-hmm. is um you know affecting you obviously um biochemically yeah. and also energetically absolutely I, I i would uh i would agree that agree with that very often when i'm working with couples and there's a a sex issue or they're not having mutual orgasms or they're not enjoying sex as much as they could or there's some kind of uh, dysfunction um, I'll often say well let's take orgasms and sex off the table and let's just sort of go back to a ground zero and and build up from there yeah well um I think that this podcast episode would not be complete without talking about some actual techniques and details of how to do it and um you know we don't have to cover everything there's a lot of information in ian's book she comes first um and that makes me think of another question but before i ask that um let's just talk about a few a few things that are important and that maybe you find to be the biggest um problems when people are actually performing oral sex on a woman and how to do it differently you know, I think one misconception is that the tongue or an oral sex, it's about penetration or that the tongue is kind of a, um, a stand in for the penis. And that a lot of guys, um, sort of focus on sort of showing off a little bit. And, um, you know, again, all of the nerve endings that really contribute to the female orgasm are located on the surface of the vulva. They respond to gentle stimulation rather than penetration. Some women have told me when complaining about their partner's oral sex techniques, oh, it's like, you know, the running of the bulls in Spain, a mad stampede for my clit. You know, that's not what you want to be doing. Or like when he goes down on me, it's like, you know, like a, a cobra fighting a mongoose, you know, it's just like, uh, you know, you don't want to be that that vicious cobra. Um, you want to approach oral sex again um, as a dance in which uh, a woman is, is often leading. Um, sometimes um, just providing a very flat, still tongue or a simple point of resistance. Uh, there's a, an area of the uh, vulva of the, of the clitoris that's actually just above the... Um, clitoral glands, which would be more um, in the area of the the hood that kind of covers the glands, but it's just that area, just sort of um, a little uh, above and behind the clitoral glands that's called the front commissure, and it's a a little smooth area that's so kind of like... You know the the di- you know as big as l- less than the size of a fingernail of your pinky, um, but there's a lot of nerve endings there, and that area responds you know very well to um, to pressure, not necessarily friction, but pressure. And if you just sort of get into a groove and get into a position where a woman is. Um, where there's contact between the front commissure and um, either a tongue or even better, something that's firmer than a tongue like your uh, front gum just above your tooth. If you just sort of raise your lip into kind of like a, a little bit of an Elvis Presley snarl and just kind of nestle your gum against that front commissure, which is, again, not exactly on the clitoral glands, but more sort of just above and behind the clitoral glands a little. And then just kind of get right into that and um, 
let her do um let her sort of um um set the routine it's a little like when a woman is is on top um during intercourse one of the reasons the female superior position is the position that most consistently leads to orgasms for women is because in that position they can really um get a lot of clitoral stimulation by pressing the clitoris against a ma- um, a guy's um pelvis and pubic bone and also really control the uh frequency and pressure and the nature of the stimulation against the clitoris well if you can do the same thing um during oral sex um and you know really let her sort of press into um a point of resistance again sort of like the the soft area of your your gum just above your tooth might be i i would say is ideal and really let her lead the dance in some ways you don't have to do anything more than that um you can certainly use your tongue to be um providing you know be to be uh going back and forth against the clitoris or looking inside the the vulva and the the vaginal entrance you can also you should also certainly think about you know enhancing um oral stimulation with manual stimulation whether your fingers um or a sex toy um you can um raise your fingers and sort of press into the G spot area um but certainly a combination of um manual stimulation and oral stimulation and again where you're you know less of um um the the lead dancer and more of sort of following her lead um is 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 one approach that I often recommend um for 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 people who are just sort of entering the world of oral sex. Yeah, and one thing that made a huge impression on me was you mentioned stillness as being really important as well as movement. Uh-huh. Yeah, and part of that is because you know, um men um reach a point of ejaculatory inevitability. And this has a lot to do with, you know, uh, ev- evolution and the importance of the male ejaculation to reproduction of the human race. But men can very quickly, um, often very quickly, reach a point of ejaculatory inevitability. You're going to have an uh, orgasm, you're going to ejaculate, and there's, there's no pulling back. And um, you get to that point of no return. And I think in for men, that's sort of how we conceptualize um uh, the sexual response cycle but um most women will tell you that um um they can very easily lose an orgasm and that even as an orgasm is starting to happen it can still be lost there is no point of inevitability there is no real point of no return and that's why i emphasize both stillness and predictable routines. If you're doing something and it's working, keep doing it until she lets you know otherwise. Um, too many men I hear from I hear from their partners sort of are doing great jobs. Um, a woman is very close to having an orgasm. She's very excited. And based on that excitement, they will sort of get excited themselves or change what they're doing. And it's in that change um, that a woman often loses her orgasm. So I do emphasize tuning in. I do emphasize stillness. I do emphasize following her lead. And I do emphasize, um, you know, predictable, consistent rhythmic routines. Great. Well, Ian Kerner, Thank you so much for your time and for all the valuable information that you've given us today on the podcast. And I just want to say that Ian's book, She Comes First, The Thinking Man's Guide to Pleasuring a Woman, is available on Amazon and also probably at your local bookseller. You can visit Ian on the web. His address is iankerner.com. And again, if you'd like to download the transcript and the bonus action guide for this episode, just visit neilsatin.com slash Ian, I-A-N, or you can just text the word passion to the number 33444 and follow the instructions. Ian, thanks so much again for coming on the show today. 
and for defending the orgasm, and also giving us some great words of wisdom for how to have more pleasure in our intimate lives. You're very welcome. I can't think of anything I'd rather be defending. So uh, thank you. Thank you for listening to another episode of Relationship Alive. If you like what you've heard and want to make it easier for other people to find out about us, please take a moment to subscribe to our podcast and to rate and review us on iTunes. If you have questions or comments or want to continue the conversation, you can always join our Relationship Alive community Facebook group. And for more information about today's episode, visit us online at neilsatin.com slash podcast. Or you can always text the word PASSION, P-A-S-S-I-O-N, to the number 33444 for more information. Finally, do you have a burning question that you're hoping we can have answered here on Relationship Alive, either for a future or past guest? Let me know and I'll see what I can do. Take care and see you next time.